through 20 of Matthew 28. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. If you're new here, um, you're wondering what we're all about as a church, this passage is it. If maybe you've been around for a while and uh, you, you've heard about these churches that we're planting, um, we've sent out some church plants, or, or you saw that a guy last week, Camden, came up here and preached, he'd never preached here before. Um, at New King, and you wonder, what's this all about? What, what motivates all of this? This passage is it. These are our marching orders. We've been commissioned. We've been given a very clear mission, very clear marching orders. And today we're going to examine these, and we're going to, we're praying, receive a fresh calling. So will you pray with me? One more time before we jump in. Father, so many hearts are here this morning. They've come eager to hear a word from you, looking forward to this day all week long, looking forward to worshiping you to opening up your word, to hearing from you. They're hungry. God, feed them. And then others have come stumbling in this week. They've barely made it. They've lost so much of their hunger, so much of their passion. And they're just here with a flicker, a smoldering wick of faith. God, breathe on them and others are here searching you showed up looking for something looking for some answers God draw them speak to them give life to them through the gospel through this word Lord be in my mouth help me to speak your words help me to accurately handle your words we pray it in jesus name amen amen so as you heard we are at the end of a great book and it's taken two years to get to this point we've learned a lot let me catch you up on what's happened jesus the son of god came to earth on a mission he was sent by God the Father. And that mission has been described in various ways. The angel tells Joseph that he's come to save his people from their sins. He says in another place that he's come to seek and to save the lost. His mission is to reconcile rebellious humanity back to their creator. We have been made by a holy God, and we've turned away, we've gone our own way, each person, and, and sinned, and the relationship with the God who made us has been broken by that sin. Jesus comes to reconcile us back, and here's what that looks like as we read through the gospel accounts. At about the age of 30, Jesus uh, steps out into the public eye and he begins his ministry, a teaching ministry. He's what's called a rabbi. And the way that a rabbi works is a rabbi goes and finds disciples from, uh, typically from a school. They look for the best that they can recruit, the best students, and then they ask, they invite those students, 
those learners, those disciples, to come and follow them. Well, Jesus is not like other rabbis. He doesn't go to the school. He goes to the fishing yard. He goes <laughs> to the docks, and he recruits people that kind of stink and with dirt under their fingernails, and everyday uneducated folks, and he says, I want you to come follow me. Right off the bat, this man does things differently. It says in Mark 3.14 that he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, that they might be with him. It's the first call of a disciple, to be with Jesus. So that's what they did. They followed him everywhere. They ate what he ate. They listened to what he taught. They took notes. They tried to emulate him in everything. The goal wasn't just to know what he knew, but to become who he is, become like their teacher. That's what it is to be a disciple, to follow a rabbi. Then after three years of living life together every day, of growing to love this man, to see how unique he is, that his words are perfect, that his words come straight from God, that he's powerful, that he works miracles, that he casts out demons, that he loves sinners, that he confronts the religious elite in their hypocrisy. This man is amazing, and they fall in love with him, and he's arrested, given a rigged trial, and brutally murdered by crucifixion. But this Jesus is no ordinary rabbi. You can kill him. You can put his body in a stone tomb and seal the door, and he'll just walk right out of that thing. And that's what he does. And that's what we read about. That's what we learned about last week. Jesus, the immortal king, the one who has power over death, the one who has power over sin, he comes walking out of the grave. He is the risen Lord, the risen King. And then what we read today is this surprise, this turn of events. This king isn't about to set up his, his kingdom on the earth in a physical way right now. He's not about to go and physically conquer Rome and, and set up his, his power there. No, he's got a different plan. You can never predict what he's going to do. In a turn of events, he hands this all-important mission over to his amateur disciples. It's referred to as the Great Commission. He meets them on this this mountaintop before he's going to ascend into heaven and he tells them it's up to you guys now can you imagine like put yourself in, in their shoes they were fishing three years ago or tax collectors three years ago I mean they as we've read through the book of Matthew we've seen like these they're normal people <laughs> They're like us. They, they stumble and fumble and, and make huge mistakes. And Jesus is giving them the most important mission in world history. He's passing it on to them. What's that all, what does that have to do with all of us? Well, he's passed it on to us. Us. Us fumbling, stumbling disciples. Christians who make huge mistakes, who can't seem to get our act together for one straight week. Uh, he's given this mission, this, this most important mission in all of world history to us. These are our marching orders. They're the marching orders for every Christian and for every church. When my uh, boys were little, we would give them three instructions. Go upstairs and brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, put on your pajamas. And we'd send them up. 
and about we give them about 10 minutes we go upstairs and go into their room and there sam would be ready for bed he'd be reading his book or whatever and same story every time where's daniel i don't know <laughs> and uh we'd go looking for daniel and and every time he would he would either be He'd be up, sitting on the countertop in the bathroom, like making faces at himself. <laughs> or we'd find him somewhere with a sword fighting an invisible enemy, or we'd find him building something out of paper or Legos. And time after time, he would get started obeying, and then somewhere along the way, he got off track. <laughs> And we kept asking ourselves, Tiffany and I would have this conversation over and over again, is he forgetting what we sent him to do? Or is he simply choosing not to obey? Or have we just not given him the tools that he needs to obey? That's really the only three options we could come up with. One of those three. And I, and I find this to be incredibly like the church today. We know our marching orders. They're very clear. We're going to go back over them today. Um, but maybe you find yourself today a little bit distracted from these. Or maybe you've willingly chosen to ignore them. Or maybe you feel like overwhelmed by this to the point that you just don't know where to start. So today, we're going to look at three questions from this text. What, who, and how? What's the mission that's been given to us? By looking at what it is, we're going to regain clarity, and clarity gives us passion. When we know what we're supposed to do, we can be passionate about it. We're going to look at who commanded us to do this because if you find your place if you find yourself right now saying i know what we're supposed to do i just don't really feel like that's my thing or maybe i'll get around to it when i have time then you are missing who it is that's commanded this of us and then thirdly we're going to look at how how do we do this because if you're in the spot where you look at it and you say that just feels so overwhelming i don't even know where to get started then when we look at how we're to do this it's going to greatly encourage you so let's start out looking at that first question what is our mission what is our mission look with me at verses 19 and 20 if you don't have a bible we'll read them on the screen it says, go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples. That's the imperative. That's what it's called in that statement. That's the command. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, of every people group, all over the world. Let's look at that first part. Jesus says, go. 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 It implies that there is urgency in this command. He is sending them to do something. It's going to require getting off the couch, right? It, it, it implies that there's going to have to be a willingness to step out of your comfort zone, right? This mission can't be done without a going, without without getting uncomfortable, without getting off the couch. As the Father sent him on this mission and he left what was very familiar to him and very comfortable to him, he's asking us to be willing to do that same thing. So he doesn't say, okay, disciples, if it's convenient to you or when it fits your schedule, make disciples. He says, go. Go, make disciples. 
Secondly, we see there's a real simplicity to this. He, he says, make disciples. They're to do with others what Jesus has been doing with them for three years. I don't think until this moment they knew exactly how much they were being prepared for what Jesus had for them. But they had been prepared. They'd been following Jesus around, learning from him, hearing his teaching, applying his teaching, and now he's saying, go do that with others. Go make other disciples. Replicate yourselves and, and do that all over with all people groups all over the world. What's a disciple? A disciple of Jesus is someone who is seeking to know Jesus and become like Jesus. Or it's a follower of Jesus. They're looking to him to know how to live, to know how to act, to know how to speak, to know how to think, to know how to be. And they're seeking to be as he is. That's what a disciple is. A new king, we talk about Wanting to help as many people as possible find and follow Jesus. This is what we're talking about. This is it. That's, that's us putting this into our own language. We want to help as many people as possible in as many different places as possible find Jesus. To find him. That's to, to see him, to believe in him, to become his disciple. That's how a person becomes a disciple. Every person who hears the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, that he's come into the world, that he died in our place on a cross for our sins in order to reconcile us back to God, that he was buried and on the third day he rose from the grave. Every person who believes that, who embraces that, and who turns from their sin to him, to follow him, it's called repentance, becomes a disciple. Something supernatural takes place inside of us. We go from death to life. Our eyes get open. We see everything differently. We see the world differently. We see Jesus differently. It's the entry point into a new and supernatural life with God. And so that's why we say it's the entry point. It's once a person has found Jesus, we want to help them follow Jesus, continue in this new and supernatural life, which brings us to the next thing that Jesus said, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is the very first thing that we're commanded to do as brand new followers of Jesus is get baptized. It is a response. It's an obedience to him. I want to look at what, what it's all about, what it's for. Whenever we read through the book of Acts, which is kind of the follow-up to the Gospels, and it's what, what did this look like as these disciples went to carry out this mission, and they're going around and they're sharing the Gospel with people, what happened is people believed, and the very next thing they did was they got baptized. They got baptized. Baptism is a symbolic union with Jesus because when you believe and he puts his life in you, you actually become united with his life, infused with his life. <laughs> and so baptism is showing that. We, we take a person into water. We, we submerge them into water. They come up. The word baptism, it, it's baptizo in the Greek, and it literally means to submerge or to cleanse with water. They, they go under the water, and we don't leave them there. Don't worry. We pick them right back up, and it symbolizes that Christ, he died, and he was buried, and then he rose again, and that we, as we are united with him, our old life is dead, buried, and gone. And we're raised to a brand new life, a brand new clean slate with Jesus. 
It's a public thing. It's a public identification with Jesus. Like a wedding. You, you want witnesses present because you're making a covenant. You want others to celebrate it with you. Baptism is a holy celebration <laughs> with people to see. And, and people say, I would do it if I wasn't so nervous, but that's kind of the point. It's a step of obedience to say, I don't care if I'm nervous. I don't care if I'm shy in front of people. I'm identifying myself publicly with Jesus. And that's the way I'm going to do it from here on out. That's the way we're called to live. We're not, we're not to be ashamed of Jesus publicly. In fact, the Bible says if we shrink back like that in shame, then when he returns, he's going to reject us. It's evidence that we didn't really know him. And so, it only makes sense that the very first act, the very first step that Jesus wants a follower of his to take is a public identification with him. It sets the tone for the rest of our lives. So that's the first step of many obediences in a Christian's life. But then following him, it involves conforming every square inch of our lives to his teaching. And that's what this next part says. Teaching them, verse 20, to observe all that I have commanded you. All. Teaching them to observe all. The word here, observe, it means to attend to carefully. It, it, it gives you this picture of like searching through the scriptures very, very methodically. Making sure you don't miss a single word. Observe my commands. Some translations say teaching them to obey. And that's another great word here. And I think a better word because... That's what this is about. It's actually about obedience. It's about obedience. Are we going to obey the Lord, the one who's in charge? All of what he says, not what we pick and choose, not the commands we like. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not a buffet, the Bible. <laughs> it's all authoritative, every single word. It's all his words. And so he says, I want you to obey them all. All that I've commanded you. Where do we, we find them? By searching the scriptures. Praise God, we're not reliant upon oral stories and traditions passed down. We have it right here in black and white. We know what he's commanded if we want to know. Right? Right? right here for us so these are the commands that he's given us we're to make disciples we're to baptize them we are to obey everything fully that he commanded us back in uh, 1961 great NFL coach named Vince Lombardi he had um, had a very disappointing end to his previous football season with the Green Bay Packers and he walks in on the first day of training camp and the whole team is sitting in the room and they're ready to get started with a new season these, these are guys at the peak of their careers and he holds up a football and he says gentlemen this is a football and he goes on to have them open their playbooks. And he begins to teach them how to block and tackle and throw and catch. He takes them back to the very fundamentals of the game. And that season, he went on to win the NFL championship 38 to nothing. And that relentless focus on the fundamentals led them to win five of the next seven NFL championships. He's a legend. 
And I find that the longer we do something, the more we have a tendency to drift away from the very fundamental things, the things that are actually most important. We drift off of mission. And we, we, we forget what it even was that we were supposed to be doing in the first place. Maybe those football players sat there that day and they thought, we've got to find a secret. What is it that's going to, to win this thing for us? What's that secret going to be? And maybe that's kind of how you think about the Christian life. But it's really about coming back to the fundamentals and focusing on them. Do you need to return to the fundamentals of the faith today? Let me give you two things. Number one, you need to focus on being a disciple. Focus on being a disciple. You, you can't replicate what you are not yourself. What are the fundamentals of this? Well, focus your whole life on Jesus. Focus your whole life on him. So, commit to read your Bible every single day. Look at what he said. Study what he said. Look for his commands so that you can obey them. Pursue him with your whole heart. Repent of sin as you see it. Sins of commission and omission. The sins that you see yourself committing and the things that you know he's commanded you to do and you're not. Repent of them. Confess them. Receive his forgiveness. And then begin to obey. It's not hard. It's fundamental. And we do all this within the context of a church in relationship with other Christians. The whole Bible is written to churches so that Christians can do these things in the context of relationship with other Christians. These are fundamental. It's how we are need to start out. We need to start out with, okay, am I being a disciple? And then secondly, if I'm being a disciple, then I need to make disciples. I need to replicate myself. I need to help other people find Jesus. I need to share the gospel with my friends and my coworkers and my neighbors and my family members. I need to share my story of coming to faith in Jesus and just share the simple message of the gospel. So that people who don't know him can find him. They can know that there's hope and life in his name. That there's forgiveness in his name. That they can have a clean slate and be reconciled to God through him. And then we need to help people follow Jesus. We, we need to sit down with them and meet with them and open the word with them and pray with them and hold each other accountable. We do this here in D groups. We do this in community group. This is happening. And if you want that, we'll help you get it here. Sitting down and helping other people follow Jesus more fully, more closely. So we need to move on. We've answered the question, what? What is the mission? That's it. It's, it's to make disciples and hopefully seeing that and having clarity around that. And as you focus on that and meditate on that this week and the weeks ahead, it's going to increase your passion again. Secondly, who commanded us? So this is for those of us who hear this commissioning, they hear this command, and we shrug our shoulders and say, so what? So what? You hear it clearly, there's no question what it is, but you look at it and you say, yeah, but I'm busy. You need to hear who commanded us. Number one, point of who he command who, who commanded us this is the risen lord don't forget what took place right before this he walked out of the grave this is the risen lord it says in verses 18 and 19 he says to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me go therefore go therefore 
In other words, I've got all the authority to do this, to command you to do this, and, I'm, and my authority is backing you. Go. This is the risen Lord. He has all authority. That means all, he, he is in control, in charge of the unseen realm and the seen realm. There is no realm that he is not ruling over. That he has full access to all powers within both realms. And he says, that's, the, that's my domain, all of it's mine. I'm in charge of it all. Go. Consider what this means. It means he commands the universe. Everything from molecules to stars and galaxies. It means he commands angel armies. <laughs> Heavenly beings and wind and waves and trees and demons and sickness all obey his every word. And that's just what we've seen in this book, in Matthew. That's who it is that's commanded us. And who are we? If the wind obeys him, who are we to ignore his command? Secondly, I want us to see not only that he's the, the risen Lord, but he's worthy of He's worthy to be obeyed. Look at verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. They worshipped him. And some doubted. I, I looked into this, these doubters. I was confused that these 11 would doubt him at this point because some, starting out, um, some did, right? But then he dealt with that he showed them his hands and his side he had them touch and, and commentators seem to agree that this probably is getting at some of the larger group that by this point he's addressed a crowd at least at one point of 500 people these these 11 they're they're convinced by this point and if you're here in this room today and and you are having your doubts don't run off somewhere to try and get those figured out. Run to him. Let him convince you the way he did his disciples. But those who saw him, those who saw him rightly, those who'd seen him with their eyes opened, they worshipped him. <laughs> they worshipped him. This is what happens when you see Jesus rightly. You worship him. In, in Revelation, it tells us this is what's happening in heaven. When, you know, right now we're looking at him through this glass dimly, it says in one place in the Bible. We're looking through. We're just getting little glimpses of his glory. Like, anybody ever picked honeysuckles? And, and, and you just get this tiny little taste of sweetness. Up here in the north, I can't ever find any that have sweetness in them, but in the south, you do. <laughs> but, but, but maybe you've tasted that. It's like this tiny little taste of sweetness. And, that, and you know, like, oh, there's more of that. i got to have more of that. And you just pick them and pick them. That's what it's like. It doesn't matter how hard you suck on that thing. That's all that's coming out, one little drop. We are looking through a glass dimly right now but we got to keep picking off the vine we got to keep looking we got to keep searching we got to keep looking for his glory when we get to heaven the glass is being removed we're going to see him full face open face glory and here's what it's going to happen it says and they sang a new song saying worthy are you jesus worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Amen. And it 
goes on. These living creatures and elders and angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands are going to be saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That's what it's going to invoke in us in heaven when we see him clearly. And every time we get a little clearer glimpse of him now, it invokes worship. And worship, worship always leads to obedience. Worship is laying your life down as a living sacrifice. It always leads to obedience. He's worthy. When we see him, that he is the one worthy, the risen Lord, the victorious king, he's glorious in strength and power. This is God in human flesh. It compels us to listen to what he's saying and do it. So let me ask you, are there ways you know right now that you're disobeying this Lord of glory? The Bible would say we cannot call ourselves a Christian and go on intentionally, knowingly living in disobedience. So what's needed is that we, we turn to him. Because this Lord of glory, this one with all authority and power and dominion, he's also very, very kind and very, very patient and very, very loving. And he is standing with open arms saying, come to me and let me show you who I am and that I'm worthy of your life. How does he do that? Well, it's so interesting. Luke's gospel tells us that as he's dealing with the disciples' doubts and as he's, as he's interacting with his disciples, it says in Luke 24, 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Here he is sitting in the flesh in front of them, and he says, you're not seeing things rightly. Let me help you out. And he has a Bible study with them. Do you know that you have access to that same Bible? To see him? To search for him? To get a glimpse of his glory? So go to the word and ask him to open your mind to understand, to see him, that it would invoke genuine worship so that you would be compelled to go. So we've asked the question and answered what? What is the mission? Who? Who is commanding this of us now third and this is a shorter point how do we do it how do we do it and this is probably for most of you in this room this is probably the most important this is probably what you need to hear today unless we answer this final question then we're going to leave from here with a little bit of excitement and and we're going to sputter out really quick because we'll get overwhelmed with how big this is and how small we are Here's how we do it. Verse 20. He says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Such an easy statement to read over quickly and miss how significant this is. God, all through the Bible, He's been making a way for this. He's been making a way to be with his people. This is what he's saying. He's saying, I know that I'm giving you, I'm commissioning you to go and do something that seems impossible. World evangelization, it seems impossible. Going and making disciples, it seems impossible. How are these uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, how are they going to go do this? How are they going to accomplish this mission? 
Jesus had explained it to them before he was arrested. And John gives us the account. Do you know that? John 14 through John 16, he's explaining exactly how this is all going to happen. What he says to them in, the, in that passage is, he says, he's going away. But then he says, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you. There, he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to be in you. And this is the secret to it all. He says, he tells them over and over again in that, in that passage that they can pray and ask him to do things, and he'll do it. Just like he had done for them as they'd lived with him for those previous three years. He tells them that the Holy Spirit will speak to them. In other words, he's saying, look, I know this has been amazing these last three years. We've been together these last three years. You've been able to ask me to do things, and I've been able to do them for you. And I've been able to speak to you and teach you. And he says, and he, and he says this, he says, you're going, when I go away, I'm going to go to the Father, and you're going to do the things that you've seen me do, and even greater things. He says, it's actually to your advantage that I'm going away. This is how. This is how it happens. The relationship will continue as it had before, even as he is physically not there. And this is how we do it as well. We're not on our own in this. We have access to him still. We can speak to him and ask him to do things, miracles, and, and if we believe and if they're according to his will, it will happen. It's that simple. And he can speak to us and remind us of all the things that he's taught us. His Holy Spirit speaks to us and empowers us. This is the secret to the whole plan. Christ with us. He's not asking any one of us to do anything on our own. Whatever he commands us to do, he empowers us to do in relationship with him. Remember the story of Peter walking on water? How did Peter have the power to walk on water? He'd been commanded. That's it. He said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. And when Jesus said, come, Peter had the ability to walk on water. Because with the command comes the power to obey. As long as our eyes are on him. And this is no different. He has said, go make disciples. You have the power to obey as long as you keep your eyes on him. As long as you're in relationship with him, you can do this. The fundamental tool that we've been given for this task is relationship. He wants you to reach the lost. He wants you to help people to obey all that he's commanded. He wants you to transform your family. He wants you to transform your workplace. He wants a harvest of souls right here in Chittenden County. And he expects that to come through our obedience. So let's come back to the fundamentals. What is the mission? It's to make disciples. Who's commanded us to do that? The one who is king and how will it be accomplished? In a relationship with him. If you believe this today, that, that Jesus is indeed who he said he was, that he's the son of God, that he came and lived a perfect life, that he died 
in our place on the cross to take our sins upon himself, that he was buried and on the third day he rose from the grave bodily, proving that he is the Son of God. If you believe those things and you turn from your sins and trust in Christ, he will save you, give you a brand new start today so that you can begin to live a supernatural life with God and you can be invited into the greatest mission the world has ever known to make disciples. Let's pray. Lord, these, these are your words we've read and looked into. And we do not want to take that lightly. This is going to take great faith, Lord. In order for us to please you, your word says that we must have faith. And so, Lord, would you infuse your people now with faith? And Lord, anyone in here who does not yet know you, I pray you'd give them the gift of faith that they could see you, Jesus, for who you are. Help us now to go from here to do things that will require risk to get off the couch to go in order to obey so that more disciples could be made more churches could be planted ultimately so that you would receive more glory the glory that you're due we pray it in jesus name amen